I want to turn to H133, please. Uh, and we do have, uh, we'll start with Eric Davis, um, who is available today. Thank you so much, Eric, for, um, for being able to come back today. And, and I know that we do have your testimony um, has been posted as well. So welcome, good morning. Hey, good morning, Th thank you guys for having me back. Uh, I, I can see you're very busy, so I'll, I'll try to uh, get through it in good time here. Um, the, for the record, Eric Davis, I'm the president of Gun Owners of Vermont. We are an all volunteer nonprofit advocacy group dedicated to the preservation of the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I apologize for not being ready to go yesterday is scheduled. We went the last few days expecting some more drastic modifications to this bill um, that we had to testify on. And we were surprised to see when we finally received it that it was, it was just sort of a, uh, a movement and uh, a relocation of most of the wording. But anyhow, um, as we grow to understand this bill, we see that it actually contains two separate issues and that it has obvious implications for the standards of evidence used in different legal proceedings, but more directly, it focuses on the power of the court to act upon a finding that abuse has occurred in a domestic relationship. In this particular case, H-133 seems to be an attempt to clarify the court's assumption that one of its tools is the suspension of constitutional rights, specifically the right to keep and bear arms. For the purposes of this testimony, we'll save the evidentiary standards for another conversation and focus solely on the latter question of whether or not the court does and or should have this power. I'm actually very grateful for the opportunity to wait until the end to give this testimony because it's allowed us to hear what legislative counsel and judiciary had to say, um, as well as a few more hours to do a little background research into how this uh, policy and assumption sort of came about. Um, in the walkthrough yesterday, Legislative Counsel Eric Fitzpatrick explained it as follows, and I'm going to quote from his testimony here, quote, if the court already has this power, where does it come from? The answer is it comes from the inherent powers of the judicial branch of government as an independent and co-equal branch of government. There is inherent authority and power. This is a concept that is universally recognized that, you, that the judiciary has some inherent authority just as the executive branch does and the legislative branch does. And of course, there's certainly debate about what that inherent authority includes, but the fact that it exists is universally recognized by the Supreme Court, end quote. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick cited a case from 2007 in the Nevada Supreme Court, Halverson versus Hardcastle, which included language describing the inherent powers of the judiciary as being derived from the separation of powers doctrine, which establishes it as one of the three branches of government. Now, yeah, obviously legislative, executive, and judicial being the three branches, um, as well as by quote, the sheer existence of the judiciary and in itself. Also noted was a caveat, presumably also determined by the court that the court's inherent power should be exercised only when traditional methods fail or an emergency. So um, some very broad wording there. So with the limited time available, um, we looked up the Halverson and Hardcastle case. And interestingly enough, we couldn't find any mention about the court's inherent authority to suspend constitutional rights. Rather, the Halverson case seemed to deal with the authority of a uh, superior court judge to discipline a subordinate. Um, we were unable to find a direct reference to the possession of firearms in this case. And I, I'm realizing now as I'm reading from my paper that I, I did not link that case to my testimony. And I, uh, I apologize, I'll do that shortly after I, I get off here so you guys can uh, have a look at that as well. Um, uh, however, we, we didn't notice any references to firearms in this case, but there may be some other examples of case law which do give more detail on this presumed inherent ability of the court to act in this manner and that you were just not familiar with. Um, and we would certainly be interested in investigating that further should time allow. Um, after pondering this a little bit more, we're, we're left with a few questions. We noticed that uh, in Halverson that when justifying its power to act on unspecified matters, the court repeatedly cites, uh, quote, longstanding assumptions and universal acceptance uh, that uh, they have this power, much like the arguments that we're hearing in favor of H-133. And we're left to wonder that if these powers are not, as the Federation pointed out yesterday, specifically spelled out by law, um, as in the law created by the legislative branch of government, 
uh, where exactly did these assumptions of power originate? And at what point in time did the court take it upon themselves to assume that they have an independent and absolute authority to suspend constitutional rights in an emergency or if traditional methods fail? Uh, furthermore, if these powers are not specified by legislation, we're wondering how might they be challenged legally by the people, um, as in a, a court challenge to, to this assumption. Um, and if the court has usurped this power, how could we possibly expect them to rule impartially on whether or not they should have it. Uh, to more narrowly uh, tailor our focus directly to the point of this bill is to ask the question, should this be allowed to continue? And before we answer that question, we should consider a few more things. Um, first, if we look at existing law in 15 VSA 1104, it already gives the court authority to require the defendant, and I'm paraphrasing here, to stop abusing family members and pets, refrain from interfering with the plaintiff's personal liberty, to maintain physical separation, and to refrain from contacting the defendant or abused family members. Um, this proposed amendment to H-133, as we now know, seeks to establish a section E to that wording, which specifically spells out the court's authority to confiscate firearms based on an initial pretrial determination of abuse and without notice to the defendant. We would once again like to point out that when pressed for details on the authority to actually confiscate the guns in question, the court admitted that even though this wording would give them power to require relinquishment, it gives them no power to issue a search warrant to enforce relinquishment without probable cause to suspect that a crime has been committed. If these things hold true, and if the court has long taken the position that they have the inherent authority to suspend a person's Second Amendment rights in the event that traditional methods cease to work, or in case of an emergency, or in this case, uh, that a ruling uh, has been reached that abuse has occurred, then why would the court at this point simply not assume that it also has the authority to sidestep the Fourth Amendment and issue a search warrant for seizure of firearms without evidence of a crime? Additionally, if this inherent power has gone unchallenged for so long, why is there a sudden need for specificity? We keep hearing that this inherent power is universally accepted and that judges are in agreement. However, the fact that we are here discussing this bill as such today suggests that that might not be the case. It's also concerning to us that the one modification to this bill, other than moving the placement of the language, was to strip out the wording that there must be evidence or at least mention of firearms in the report for this action to be carried out against the defendant. We understand the court's position that it would be unfortunate for some sort of um, incidental language to hinder their ability to reach a judgment of whether or not abuse has occurred. Um, however, to strip that language entirely and with it all safeguards on the defendant's right to keep and bear arms, suggests that the court seeks to retain absolute control over the decision to seize guns as long as the evidentiary standard is met to determine that abuse has in fact occurred and regardless of the context in which guns may or may not be involved in this particular incident. Again, let me reiterate, the court seeks absolute power to suspend constitutional rights by requiring the defendant to relinquish their firearms over a civil issue regardless of circumstance and without a hearing. Moreover, when considering this process in the context of taking place within the framework of due process, we find it sorely lacking. Going back to Legislative Council's description of due process, Mr. Fitzpatrick states, and I'm gonna quote from him here again, generally that means notice and opportunity to be heard. Um, he then states, quote, here you can see that there is a deprivation happening. However it occurs, there is definitely a deprivation of the person's firearm that is only happening because the law requires. So the question is, is there sufficient due process given that there is this deprivation is happening? And I think the answer to that is yes. The key point here is that generally speaking, when you talk about notice and an opportunity to be heard, the hearing has to be held pre-deprivation. Here you see this doesn't happen. The property is taken first and the hearing happens afterwards, usually within 14 days, and that is what is known as a post deprivation hearing and that is permitted under constitutional due process requirements as long as there is a 
prompt and meaningful hearing as the court describes afterwards. And um, he also goes on to state that the court has been careful not to quantify what they consider to be a quote prompt and meaningful uh, rather they seek to retain the absolute discretion of setting the time period for the defendant's hearing and thus their due process in each instance. We live in a country whose basic founding documents are based on the principles of protecting individual rights from the horrors of unchecked government. The folks who gave us the Bill of Rights also enshrined into our system of justice a right to counsel, the right to have a fair and speedy trial by one's peers, and the guarantee that all 12 of those peers return a unanimous conviction of a crime based upon evidence beyond a reasonable doubt before a person might be deprived of their life, liberty, and property. We cannot imagine that these same folks envisioned a system of checks and balances that gives an absolute and arbitrary power to one branch of government with which they might suspend and reinstate constitutional rights at will over a civil matter. While the court's intentions seem honorable with this particular policy, we shudder at the implications of a body of government that has broad and liberal discretion to interpret its own rules of operation when dispensing justice and then be the sole arbiter over whether or not it should have this power. And, and I want to kind of go off script here. And I want to point out that we, we understand that the, the motivations of this are, are um, genuine and good and that the court is, is attempting to help people here. You know, we, we get that. Um, it, it's just that when constitutional rights are implied, we believe there should be a much um, higher bar of scrutiny. So in conclusion, we return to our question at the crux of this debate. Should the court, at their own discretion, and regardless of past assumptions, have the power to suspend a person's constitutional right to keep and bear arms and do so without prior notice to the accused? After considering all these factors outlined above, we must conclude that the answer to that question is a resounding no, and we continue to oppose this bill. Thank you. That's, that's all I have for today. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I can tell you put a lot of time into this. And um, so I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad that we were able to get you get you in today. And um, you said you wanted to make a, a change or two. So please go ahead and do that. And we can we can repost, um, you know, the correct. Certainly. Well, I'm just going to add some citations that I, I realized I left out after I read it here. Okay. I did kind of late work on it last night. So uh, but appreciate you guys having me back. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let me just see if Committee members, any questions? Not seeing any hands. No. Nope. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, Have a great day. Great. Thanks, you too. Okay, um, Major Jonas, good morning. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I will kind of reiterate some of the things that I mentioned when I was here previously. Sorry, I had to hop off yesterday. Um, and then I'm happy to answer specific questions about storage and the process for uh, when we do relinquish firearms. Um, but just again, for the record, uh, my name is Ingrid Jonas. I am um, at the rank of major, and that means I'm a division commander with the Vermont State Police. Uh, this is my 23rd year with VSP. Um, I actually joined the department to try and be part of change um, and how we respond to um, and handle violent crime. So I spent over a decade responding to and investigating violent crime. It's a pleasure to be included in these discussions that you have as a committee. So thank you for your hard work on behalf of survivors. Um, I think for some context, I'll just give some real numbers for DV related responses for Vermont State Police. So in 2020, uh, we responded to 1,304 family disturbances. So that would be um, domestic violence, domestic assault, et cetera. Um, we responded to 113 domestic violence, I'm sorry, domestic abuse order violations. So orders from the court that were allegedly violated, 113 responses there, um, six homicides last year. Um, and in 2019, we responded to uh, fewer family disturbances, 
1180, 94 domestic abuse order violations and five homicides. Um, focusing back on the bill that you are working on, uh, we see it as really a, a simple bill. The bill codifies what's already occurring. That is the court uses their authority and wisdom to take action to promote safety, namely to order firearms relinquished in certain emergency relief from abuse order um, cases. We support the power of the court to promote safety in this manner, and we will continue to serve and enforce orders as partners in this effort. Um, and we frequently serve and enforce court orders as a fundamental part of our work. Um, as I think you know, um, firearms are a dangerous part of certain domestic violence cases and are used as part of a pattern and a course of conduct of control and threatening behavior. Um, and so we see this as a critically important tool that the court should have at their disposal. Um, let's see, I know yesterday, I think this is really important. And um, so I want to just reiterate that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Commissioner Sherling said um, that DPS is willing to step in and assist other departments with storage to the greatest extent possible. Um, we, I need to, connect with the commissioner on this, but as you know, um, the firearms relinquishment procedures are outlined in 20 VSA 2307. And we, DPS can help sort of build capacity around the state for storage opportunities for any departments that may um, need storage in their area, um, utilizing the law on, that's already on the books. And that law actually gives DPS that role. Um, so I think more work can be done in that area. Um, but I would want to say very clearly that questions or issues around storage should not be accepted by this committee as an obstacle. Um, and they should not impede the passing of this law. It's kind of like comparing like apples and cats. You know, storage is a law enforcement ingenuity and management matter and it should not be a viable obstacle to the work that you're doing here um, to promote safety. Um, would it be helpful for you if I um, talk to you about the procedure of like what happens when we do respond, um, serve an order that has relinquishment as part of its components? I, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so, um, and I will just in fairness, it's been a little while since I've served an order. So I went directly to a member of our department who has served in, who serves orders regularly. Um, so upon the service um, of an abuse prevention order um, or temporary order in which there's requirement for the defendant to relinquish firearms, the trooper on scene will meet with the defendant and provide the defendant a copy of the order an actual copy of the order. The trooper will read the order verbatim with the defendant um, to include the, the section that speaks of relinquishment of firearms to the state police. Um, at that time, should the defendant comply with the order, the defendant then turns over all firearms and ammunition to the trooper. The trooper secures the firearms and ammunition and returns to the field station where the items are stored in a secure location. Each station has a specific area where non-evidentiary firearms are, are kept. Um, they're kept in lockers, essentially locked down lockers. Those items are, those firearms are logged in detail into an evidence tracking system that we have. It's an online system. The trooper will also document um, the, the same items, the relinquished firearms in a formal online CAD reporting system assigned with a case number um, so that the case number for the firearms links into the, the actual abuse prevention order or temporary order. Um, the firearms remain stored until notice is received from the court um, that they can be released to the defendant or another appointed person. Um, so the court may also dismiss the order, which would then allow the defendant to retrieve the firearms. When it comes to the station, the firearms are then removed and um, the log is amended, the online 
documenting system is amended to show that they've been relinquished. I'm sorry, they've been removed. Um, so our non-evidentiary firearm locker system is monitored by a supervisor or a station commander. Um, let's see, so if the defendant does not comply with the order um, and the firearms are clearly identifiable in the defendant's possession, the defendant could be taken into custody for violating the abuse prevention order and plain view firearms would be seized as evidence. Um, in addition, a search warrant could be applied for should probable cause to exist that there are firearms in other locations. Um, should the defendant deny any firearms are in their custody and probable cause exists to believe that the defendant is actually in possession of firearms, a trooper would apply for a search warrant for those firearms that are thought to be in the defendant's possession. And the court may or may not grant that warrant. Um, let's see. If, a, if an order is served on a defendant where the defendant's firearms are in a separate location, um, then the trooper would either make arrangements with the defendant who might give consent for us to get those or again, apply for a uh, search warrant and see if the court will grant that um, warrant. Um, and then lastly, if a defendant showed up at the field station looking for firearms, but had no documentation that um, he or she was authorized to retrieve the firearms, we would not obviously accept that. The defendant has to have um, court order that shows, and we would verify that the court order is clear that those firearms can be given back to the defendant. In addition to that, we, we would run the person through a um, National Crime Information Center check to make sure that um, there aren't any abuse prevention orders still in existence. And that is kind of a summary of what it's like uh, from the road standpoint when you're serving an order that has to do with relinquishing firearms. Thank you, that's, that's um, very helpful. I have a few questions, then we'll um, turn to the committee. I see Tom has a question. Um, you mentioned the, um, the CA, the, the CAD, the, um, the online system. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that in terms of, just, yeah, go, go yeah. ahead. Because I, I, I imagine that that sounds concerning to some folks. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So, well, if, if there's a court order um, service of an abuse prevention order, so we receive a, an abuse prevention order from the court, it, will, it needs to correspond with the case. So then it would be entered into our system where every action that we take is documented. So everything from a car crash to a motor vehicle stop to a simple assault, um, et cetera. So it would go into the system as service of an abuse prevention order or something along those lines and assigned to a member of the department who's then responsible to serve the order. Um, does that help? Or? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I just, I, I imagine some folks are wondering, is this creating a registry? Is this, um, yeah. So, so that just wondering in, um, in terms of that, in terms of the firearms and. Um, okay. Well, um, it's more on our end, I mean, these are public records. These documents are public records. They're, they are a way to um, establish the actions that are taken in every instance, as I said, everything from a, you know, abuse prevention order to a car crash to a, you know, documenting what happened, what actions were taken, what evidence was taken, what um, items were taken for safekeeping, et cetera. It's a checks and balances and way to keep track. Great, thank you. And then if the order is, um, if a final order is not issued, is that noted as well or is anything? Correct, yeah, so the, it, let's say the defendant isn't, isn't around or isn't able to be located, then that is tracked. Each attempt to serve the order is dated and tracked and then pass to the next um, person on shift if it's unable to be um, achieved during that one trooper's shift. 
Okay, thank you. So this uh, you do this with with all your cases. It's not just it's Correct. not just firearms. It's not just domestic violence. Okay, great. Correct. Thank you. Um, all right, I see um, Felicia and Tom. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question for you, Major. Um, at the point in which the defendant has the court order to have uh, their firearms returned to them, is there ever a point in which a fee is charged for any of that storage, whether it's offsite or in VSP's capacity or other law enforcement? I'm just trying to ensure that this process would not have a financial burden to it. Right. Yeah, so it is my understanding that VSP is not charging any defendant in a case such as this for the storage of firearms. We aren't charging anybody. Um, I would imagine it's incredibly rare that any department is charging a defendant. Um, I can't speak for other departments. I hope there are other folks listening that can help chime in, but we are not charging defendants for storage of their firearms. Okay. And is that something that under current law you have the ability to do and you choose not to, or it's just not within your purview? So I'd have to review 2307. I believe that it creates a path forward for um, defendants to be charged if their firearms are stored by um, firearms dealers. Okay. Licensed okay. firearms dealers. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'll get an answer for that. My understanding is that at, the, at this temporary stage, right. um, these are not charged. So I think there's a distinction between um, temporary order and a final order. That makes perfect sense. I think you're right on that. So, but, but thank you, Felicia. Well, I'm gonna look it up and we'll get, um, get Eric as well. Um, okay, Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony, Major. Um, so, with I, I'll never be happy with 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 the <laughs> information that's collected. I, I understand that's the procedure, and and, uh, and and I'm pretty sure that uh, even if say if a case is thrown out, that you you probably still keep that information somewhere. Um, which, like I said, that, that'll never make me happy. But, but one thing I, I did like, I, I like the, your detailed presentation on what happens to people's property. Um, again, I may not like, you know, that it's, that it's taken, but it, it, uh, it does give me, a, I don't know if the right word is some comfort, uh, knowing exactly how it happens and uh, will probably quell any, any questions I have about storage in the future. Um, cause, I, cause I know I brought it up on, uh, you know, more than one occasion, probably more than two or three, but, um, so anyway, uh, thank you for that. And, uh, I, I guess if I ever ask any more questions about storage of firearms in the future, re remind me of this testimony, but, but, uh, I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you. Any, I'm not seeing. Any other hands? I, I know we also have a joint assembly we need to go to. Um, okay, thank you. Major, I'll let you continue. I also note that the commissioner is here and is always welcome to chime in. I would defer to the commissioner then at this point, unless there's anything more specifically I can address. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, appreciate your testimony. Commissioner, good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, uh, actually, no need for the major to defer. I, I just had this on my calendar, so I was stopping in in the event uh, there were any questions specific to me. I did catch the last uh, 10 or 12 minutes of the major's testimony. I think uh, she's got uh, as good or better command of this topic uh, as she does on many things than I do. So, Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so... Um, David, Chair from the Attorney General's Office, if we could hear from you very, very quickly, because we are being asked to sign in um, ahead of the uh, Joint Assembly, if we can. So, David, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to, uh, David Chair, with the Attorney General's Office, for the record, just wanted to address a couple questions that had come up yesterday, I believe, and, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to, to be here then as well. I wanted to emphasize the legal point that uh, relief from abuse orders, uh, or I, sorry, let me let me reverse that. 
extreme risk protection orders are not a substitute for relief from abuse orders. The processes are not the same. They are not duplicative of each other and they don't perform the same uh, a function. And they most importantly, simply don't operate the same way. Let me um, read to you a, a brief paragraph from a case in Vermont uh, explaining the purpose of the abuse prevention statute. It says, Vermont's abuse prevention statute is designed to provide immediate relief to victims of domestic violence. The statute focuses on fast temporary relief to family members in immediate danger. This goal is accomplished in part by providing inexpensive and uncomplicated proceedings that allow an abused family member to obtain immediate relief without the need for counsel, advanced pleadings, or a full-blown evidentiary hearing. Uh, extreme risk protection orders, by contrast, require lawyers. Uh, they require uh, affidavits and motions to be prepared and filed by lawyers. I think it's fair to say that as a general rule, uh, the more lawyers you have involved in something, the slower something moves. And the point of the relief from abuse orders is really to cut out some of that, um, uh, make it more lawyerless process, cut out some of the lawyers involved and allow an individual who needs relief to go directly to court. They can go to court at any time, uh, night or day, weekend, weekday. Uh, and while there are, uh, and there's an entire um, statutory provision, 15 BSA 1106, that lays out how an individual can get relief after hours. Um, and while that is possible to do with the ERPO statute, the Extreme Risk Protection Order statute, uh, again, it requires first persuading a state's attorney or, or assistant attorney general that there um, is a need explaining that, having that person prepare prepare uh, documentation. It's, it's, it's not the same. It does not allow for the same level of relief. And just wanted to emphasize that point as a matter of law. There's significant difference. Um, and the relatively lawyerless process of the RFAs is an essential one that is not duplicated elsewhere. Great, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Were you reading from Benson by any chance or from another case? Oh no, that case, sorry, I should have said what that case was. It is Rap v. Dimino, and uh, it's, uh, 162 VT1 is is a site is the citation for it, and I can send that to the committee for uh, for posting. That'd be great if you can send it to to Evan for posting. That'd be excellent. Thank you. Uh, questions, committee members? Nope. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. We uh, Actually, we did a lot of work in a, about an hour and a half. So appreciate everybody. And um, we will um, adjourn so we can get to the...